Yes, my people, I'm here today with your positive news and we're linking up with Antoine Dixon Bellet. He's a producer with a production company called Mastermind Media. He's worked with some of your favorite artists from KSI to Stormzy to Lil Wayne. On top of the production company, he also runs a rental company which rents high-end cinema equipment called City House. And he even sells his own lens through a company called CityScope Optics. Some of the lenses were actually used in Netflix's latest show, Ozark, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen. On top of all of this, he owns properties, including East London Studios, which we're at today, one of two studios. And we're just linking up to him today to kind of give you guys some gems, like a little bit more educational content. And even for some of you that are trying to get into this industry, know how you can get your foot in the door from someone that's already done it. Yes, my bro, how you doing? You good, yeah? Nice to meet you. Yeah, thank you for bringing us down here today, man, showing us around. Yeah, yeah, pleasure. Cool, yeah, bro, just take us inside and we'll have a little look around. So this is the um, studio canteen. Okay. Oh, right, okay, you got our case machine, yeah? That's how you're coming. So yeah, so we've got, this is where crew will eat. Normally, um, pre-COVID, there's tables that are laid out and catering comes in here and this is where the film crew will basically um, eat their food. See this picture, oh, is that Stormzy? Yeah, so this is Stormzy. This was shot at our other studio, uh, um, E10 studio. Okay, so this, our other stage. we're in the North London one now yeah, and you had, you had another one in East London. London. Uh, that was actually one of my companies that shot this video. Uh, this was a Mastermind Media production for yeah. a video called Cold. If I, if I remember correctly. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I recognise it. No, yeah, cold. I recognise it. Um, shout out my daughter. She was in that video as well. Really? Yeah, when you spoke about young black queens, we had a picture of my daughter in that video. <laughs> so sick. shout out my beautiful princess. Whose idea was that then? It was his idea. It was his, it was his idea. idea. But, but he was like, let's get some people together. I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah, this yeah. This is my daughter. Oh, nice, man. Nice, <laughs> so, um, nice. So yeah, that was a family. So was the whole video of that, I can't remember the whole video. I think it was all shot in the studio, right? If I remember correctly. Correct. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right. It was right, yeah. Yeah, it was a big set. You had some snow machine and it was good. Yeah, yeah. It was good. And for a video like this, you know, a big kind of, this Storms is arguably the biggest artist mm -hmm. in the UK at the moment. How much does this kind of video cost? Like, what kind of budget are people looking at? Uh, again, it's a piece of string mm -hmm. you're looking at 30 to 100. It just, it's right. thousand yeah, yeah. we're talking, yeah? Yeah. So, um, so it just really does depend. And the reason why is because you've got, especially when you've got big set builds, you've got to hire the studio for three days. Mm -hmm. One day is to pre-light, one day is to set build. You pre-light first. Yeah. Because if you're shooting from above, if the set's in the middle, how'd you get to the pre-light? How'd you get to the rigging? Right, right, right. So, so that's got to be done day one pre even before you even... Before you shoot. Day oh, one. So the pre-production must be crazy then. Of course. Yeah. But this is for big films. This is for sets, big set building. Mm -hmm. So day one's pre-light. You get all your lighting in, the, in place. Day two is set building. Mm -hmm. Your carpet, your art director hires construction team, which is your carpenters, your, your set designers. They come in, they build your sets pain because you can't do that on the day right it's, right, it's yeah. longer than the shoot day yeah yeah it yeah. has to all be done in advance the artist is going to be waiting for the paint ah, to dry you know what i'm saying it doesn't it, make it, no it, sense yeah, no yeah. we all stand there and watch yeah so once all the sets built that's two days mm -hmm. then day three is principal shooting if you've got a good enough shot list and you've got a great first day d you can actually get that done in a day but depending on how many, sh how many sets you have yeah, yeah do you yeah. have to rejig lights do you have to still relight areas which most people do get that, sh that stuff done. Then you might need the fourth day, which is called a strike in our industry. A strike means D-rig, get the lights out, yeah, break yeah. up the set, get it out of here, strike it, it out. It's not as simple as we're done, let's go home. No, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's you got to pack up everything. Like, yeah, this, is film yeah, yeah. this is a big film production. So that's a four day shoot. <laughs> so did you, you, you can now work the numbers out. It's a lot. Big massive shower. So what's, What's the like the this whoa wow you got a shower everything? Yeah. <laughs> Come have a look at this. You don't catch this in your everyday studio, man. So what's the overall like square footage of the whole um, studio? Uh, it's about six thousand, just over six thousand square foot. Wow, it's massive. Yeah. So uh, that's that. So in here you've got the production office. Mm -hmm. This is where uh, uh, production companies will be based. Their producers, mm -hmm. their production managers, right. their production assistants, they'll be based here. That's their office for the day. Okay, cool. And they're out of the way. So you've got the production office here. It's pretty cool. And the best thing about uh, these front offices is that they have big windows for the viewing gallery so you can actually see the stage and look down. In here you've got the uh, makeup and wardrobe. In here. So it's our, our four suite makeup bay, obviously for any cast, models, cast, mm -hmm. uh, not talent, they've got their own green rooms. Cool. But this is um, quite, quite a good so this space. is for like, yeah, the yeah. models, actress, actors. Yeah, exactly. yeah that makes sense. So it's um, nice. pretty cool. Nice, right? This is the East London Studios view viewing gallery. Raw, nah, this is proper still. So obviously what happens is, it's a good way of keeping 
um, people that are coming to watch away mm -hmm. from set, what sometimes can happen if you're in the wrong location, is imagine the, the conflict of having people in the way watching what's going on, which people right. would be interested about. Yeah. And you've got everybody on set, which is a health and safety issue. Okay, you know, of course. Crew don't like it, they want to so is that why you designed it this way specifically? Yes, exactly. So you can be cut completely out of the way and still have a good view okay. of what's going on. And it's good, good for health and safety. Yeah. It's the right way to do things. Yeah. So viewing galleries are quite important in, in um, film studios. So, so obviously this, this is our login, our, our uh, viewing gallery. Yeah. Sorry. So you can see everything. So we'll go down in a bit, but yeah, just show us what else we've got up here first, yeah. the green rooms and that. So we've got two green rooms, uh, green room A and green room B. Nice. Uh, this is green room A. So this will be where the artists would come. Yeah, if it's a music video or if it's a, if it's a movie, it'll be the main talent. Okay. Princi principal cast. Right, would right, basically right. be based here. So whereas the other one is for the, for, for the like people that are not extras, definitely the main talent. Dancers, yeah, yeah. models, um, um, non-essential cast, mm -hmm. effectively. But you can also open this up into one giant, we've got bifold doors that open out. Oh, right. So this could one giant green room. Essentially, if you have a lot of talent on, you can have this whole thing it, open into exactly. one thing. Exactly. Or if it's just one one main uh, talent, they might just want the space. Right, so you right, just open right. it up. Nice, and man. And split up in two. Uh, the best part of this, if you want to come through. Yeah, sure. For me, the best part, I love my bathrooms. I'm a bathrooms guy. <laughs> uh, we've got the most glorious bathroom in here. So, um, yeah, <laughs> have a look at this. This is a bathroom. 10 foot high ceilings. All my properties are all with high ceilings. Yeah. Uh, apart from one or two. And it, it just gives a nice grandioso kind of feel. Nice, man. Um, so yeah, when we actually designed this, because this film studio was designed from scratch, basically. Um, it was a former factory on two floors. Um, once I bought the building, I was able to convert it. Mm -hmm. um, and we designed a um, big open space which kind of reflects the film studio, which the actual main film stage, because obviously that's big and high, which you'll see downstairs. Yeah. So we wanted the rest of the facilities to also feel the same. Nice. This is the way in and out, basically, for crew and cast. This is the way they'll come by these stairs. You're right, it does feel bigger when you come down. Yeah, it's bigger. Yeah, it's much bigger. the high ceilings. Yeah. So how much of this, when, when you got here, it just as it was, and how much did you kind of add on to it and change? This was... Um, <laughs> Oh, I'll have to show you some photos. Yeah, you're going to have to send some photos. We'll this, edit them this, in. This was split across two floors. So this, this part as well? This whole thing oh, was Okay, floors. okay, okay. Uh, after I bought the, the property, mm -hmm. day two, the, the day after completion day, was demo. We demolitioned the entire floor. Mm. Demolitioned, everything, gone. Stripped it back to bare bones. Wow. Um, that must have been a hell of a job. It was, it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> to, 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 it, was, it, was, it was the quickest part, was the demo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and um, obviously we went back to brickwork mm -hmm. and we sound insulated, uh, acoustic sound insulation um, to make it like a soundproof stage. Okay, cool. So basically everything. So they can make as much noise as they want. You don't have to worry about neighbor complaints or anything yeah, like that. Exactly. Yeah, nice. so, so what you're seeing on the walls here is, mm -hmm. well, it looks like a wall, but behind there is like 100 mil thick insulation with acoustic board, right. another acoustic board. So it's been really well done. Mm -hmm. um, we've also added this lighting grids that was uh, made by a grip company um, to sustain all of our lighting. So anything that wants to be rigged from art department to yeah. lighting, uh, big heavy lights, big frames, it can all be rigged here safely. So from a creative perspective, if you want to light below, it can all be done from above. Mm, um, nice. And that's the bright side about having rigging. A lot of film studios don't actually have rigging. Yeah. You have to come in and scaff and build your own rigs. That's very expensive for productions yeah. and time consuming. You might spend half a day rigging yeah. before you can put It takes out through the ages, yeah. And if you've got a studio for a day, and you spend half a day rigging, you're not going to finish your production. So one of our USPs was to put the rigging pre-rigged so people can come in, get on a scissor lift. And you just and have rig. to, the scissor lift's just here as well. You can show the camera. So everything's here. You don't have to bring anything in yourself. Yeah. Just, uh, and then, you know, they could even hire the equipment from you as well then with yeah, the, yeah, your that, city house. That city house. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll take you through. The loading bay here is actually a drive-in as well. So, so it's a drive-in studio. Oh, so you could bring cars in and stuff like that. bring cars in. So depending on what your production is, um, we can do uh, what you, you bring in your action vehicle. Mm -hmm. So for anyone that doesn't know, an action vehicle is like an industry jargon for a vehicle that's seen on screen. Oh, okay, so like any car that's in the video, we'd call it an action exactly. vehicle. Exactly, it's, it's an action, you, action vehicle. So uh, another good thing about this loading is that Cine House, the rental company, backs up its vehicles here and mm -hmm. we load and unload from the stock kit. So this your there. this your kit room here? Yeah, it's the exit door. So all of this, you can see like all of this is for loading up the, the vans exactly. and stuff, right? Exactly, so um, kit comes in and out, um, we back up the trucks mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, and, and that's that. They, they go off to, uh, to people's productions. So you do both? 
Uh, look, we'll talk about this a bit more later, but you do both other people's productions and your own productions as well. Yeah, Sydney House is a, Sydney House is a camera and lighting rental company mm -hmm. that is completely independent. Yeah. Nothing to do with anything I do with my own filming. This is just an industry rental house that's hired individually by mm -hmm. production companies around the country. Yeah, cool, nice. nice. Now you've seen East London Studios. Yep. Um, come and see Sydney House. Perfect. So welcome to Sydney House. We've got a camera department over here. Wow, so this is this is huge actually, yeah, it goes yeah, really far yeah. back. With Jared here, who's um, our, our camera trainee. Mm -hmm. um, and he's um, um, working under the Euphoria, who's hard at work. He's so hard at work that he's not paying any attention. Okay, he's now. <laughs> I don't have a lens in my so, so what lens have you got there, Horia? Oh, nice. You got a um, Cook SF? SF means special flair, by the way. Mm -hmm. So they're very, very rare lenses, Cook Anamorphics. So this, there are not many in the country, but Sydney House has a set. Wow. So this camera that you've got here, let everybody know a little bit about kind of what is this camera. And if you wanted to buy a camera like this, how much would you be have to invest in? Uh, you'd have to sell your house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a Mini LF, or Alexa Mini LF, large format. Uh, this is a Super 35 lens, but we've got the update to get it to film um, Super 35 on large format. And yeah, it's about. I don't know, price point, but it's really, it, it, really Yeah, kit, kit, kit like that, with, with that type of lens, you, you're talking hundreds of thousands. Easily six figures, yeah, yeah easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if someone wanted to rent like, a piece of kit like this from you, how much would they be looking at? Kind well, of? well in the industry standard is that the camera kits are modular. So yeah. what we mean by modular is that you have different things that you would hire. There's mm -hmm. no standard kit. You have kit that might be preferred, but right, you right. have different remote focuses. You have what filters do you want in front of your matte box? The matte box is that sits at the front, yep. filters go in, in front of that. Um, obviously your lenses can be spherical lenses, anamorphic lenses, they have completely different price points. Right. Your different cameras from an Arri LF, which is full, full, uh, full, um, full frame, to a normal um, Arri Alexa, uh, to a Red Monstro, uh, there's, there's, it, it's endless, so it's very difficult to right. say, but a, a full shooting package could cost you 1500 to two grand a day, yeah. sometimes a grand a day. It really does depend on who you're working with, um, but it's not for the faint-hearted, and that's why this is not um, entry-level equipment. It's no, not for no, filmmakers that transition tell, yeah. from DSLR. You need professional film crew, um, as you hear the saying, um, um, all the gear but no idea. Yeah. You need to make sure that, that there's a trained... The person knows what they're doing before they get onto it. Yeah, because exactly. you, you can't break anything, it'll be a disaster. And mm -hmm. you want to make sure that whatever production you're using the kit on, is being showcased correctly with the equipment that you're using, yeah. or you might as well use your iPhone. And I think there's a misconception about that as well, thinking, oh, if I get the best camera, yeah. my visuals are gonna look amazing. But if you don't know how to set it, you don't know how to edit it, color grade well, it. Well, I'll give you an example. You get a Formula One car, mm -hmm. and it's the fastest car, can you drive it without crashing? There you go, that's the question, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or can you even start it? So that's an analogy for you. You mm -hmm. really do, people do underestimate, and something I would say in, in, in uh, to advocate the film industry is that people underestimate how hard it is and how much skill you need and how many how much experience you need to be in the film industry you don't just figure it out you need experience and um it's very need, technical and you need know-how yeah, so yes yeah, yeah. so, so shout out to all the film crew all of them because um they work really really hard to create like magic mm. basically so yeah. shout out to those perfect so around here you've got uh we walk into our lighting department so we have everything from like hmi lights mm -hmm. um to tungsten lights to LEDs, Arri Sky Panels, S60s. God, the list goes on. Absolutely everything. The, the list goes on, but we service everything from big film studios uh, uh, lighting mm -hmm. to big movies to small interviews. Um, so lighting is, is, is a big thing here. And what's good about Cine House is that we have lighting and camera. There are not many rental houses um, that do both. They have a camera or lighting. Uh, there are a few, but not many, so we, we pride ourselves in being able to facilitate both camera and lighting departments. Um, we've got Nathan around here, um, one of our lighting techs. Yeah. Is uh, what you're up to? I am checking this 120 back in. Basically, I'm making sure all the settings are up, operational, hasn't been messed around with too much, and I'm just factory resetting it, ready to go to go again. Perfect. That's an, yeah. an Arri uh, S120, basically, which is a pretty pretty cool light. Nice. So then. For people that maybe don't know, just to make sure even my understanding is the same. So the grids that we saw in the studio earlier, yeah. this is how it would kind of fasten on using this part here. And no, that's part of the stand. Um, oh, so that's not... It's, it's, yeah, this is part of the stand here, but but you you have def different clamps and they would clamp on. Okay, okay. There are different clamps, you have K clamps. Right, right. There's lots of different uh, uh, um, grip equipment that would put 
something like this on. Mm -hmm. You could put big lamps on as well. They don't just have to be panels. Yep. Um, you might want to hang cloth. You can do anything from up there. Right. But yeah, this is a typical example of if you wanted to shoot from above, you might want to have six of these spread yep. evenly, um, um, maybe with a bit of diffusion. Mm -hmm. Or in fact, it is quite diffused as it is. Yeah, but it feels quite soft. It doesn't feel harsh at all. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. So if we wanted to rent something like this, how much would we be looking to spend? Um, depends again, this is like kind of semi-modular like because it comes with like uh, uh, snap bags and all kinds of stuff but mm -hmm. it, you'd be looking at anything from the high 200s to the, uh, to the low 300s, so like right. 250 to 320, maybe 250. And then to buy it, how much would it cost? Around again, six, roughly. About six, about six grand. Six grand, so okay. okay. Specialist lights, again, right. you wouldn't, this is an entry level. Mm -hmm. um, film crew know what they're using and, yeah. what, and why basically. But um, yeah, it's, it's pretty ex extensive. Again, it, it, it highlights the responsibility that you have as a production to be able to, to, to be responsible for mm -hmm. really expensive equipment that slightly technical. Once you, I mean, not to discourage people, you learn and you become that person. Of course, yeah. Um, it's the same with anything, you know, you've got to put the time in yeah, yeah, if you yeah, want to get the value out it, of it. it exactly, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's basically it. <laughs> so then we've got this, you're saying, this is like six or something. We've got something over here that's six figures. And I'm seeing a lot of kit around. So all together, how much would you say you, you stock? Like how much capital do you Should have? Should I tell the answer? Place? Yeah. A lot. <laughs> Let's keep moving. <laughs> all right, so this is private, because <laughs> it's private. Um, but basically, this is the Mastermind Media Office. Okay, nice. Can I just hold the door for you? Oh, nice, man. Yeah. So this is where the magic happens. This is where the magic happens. Um, we have meetings here, basically, yeah. um, client meetings, Zoom these days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, we do a lot of pre-production meetings here. Yeah. Directors will come here. So when we do the Mastermind Media Production, directors will come in with my producers. Mm -hmm. We'll sit down, we have creative meetings, nice. uh, PPMs, and we'll just figure it all out, you know, brainstorm, Sweet. get those creative juices going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, that's, that's, that's what we do. Nice one, nice. Cool. So yeah, man, we've had a nice little studio tour, so I think it'd be good if we sit down and kind of have a little bit more of a deeper conversation with you. So you put together all these, you've got all these different things that you're working on at the same time. You've got um, Mastermind Media, you've got City House, East London Studio that we've seen. You also do your own freelance work as well. So kind of, maybe it's not obvious to somebody. Somebody might think an artist just comes, they just contact the director, the director has everything. But that's not how it works. No. You have... You go to the director, then you have to go to a producer, who the, that's the person that puts everything together. Correct. Then you have the location where you have to go film, and then you have to hire the equipment. Like, as we spoke before, these cameras are really expensive. Yeah. Most people don't own their own kit. They have to hire it out from somewhere. That's right. And normally, this would be four or five different entities, and, unless they come to you. Yeah. And then it's everything under one nice umbrella. So you kind of capitalized and monetized every section of the value chain. Yeah. So I kind of want to know a little bit about First of all, how you kind of came to that thought process of, you know what, doing one is not enough. I need sure. to capture the whole industry. And then how you went about building up what you built. Yeah, yeah, sure. So obviously Mastermind Media was the first thing I ever did. So I was a filmmaker years ago. Um, we're talking 15, 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a director. Started off like everybody else. Little camera. The cameras I used, the, the technology... Um, a lot of your audience will have no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's that long ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're, we're talking DV. Have you ever had a DV? No, I haven't. <laughs> I haven't. We use DV tapes. Okay. Google it. Yeah. I'm going to have to. Go to a museum. <laughs> well, I know about the early cannons and stuff. I don't know about DV. Before that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, so basically, um, shooting on those, um, made music videos, yep. um, uh, low budget through what was Check Called Channel U at the time. It was like an uh, unsigned type of uh, platform yeah, for musicians, and then which meant that up and coming filmmakers could also work with unsigned artists to be able to get a platform. So it wasn't just a platform for the artists; it was also a platform for the filmmakers. Right, right. Yeah, it's right. where a lot of your really cool uh, filmmakers that are still around today is still in the game from previous. Um, and uh, so it started off there. As I went up and decided that I needed to increase the production value, you start realizing that you need to use better equipment. You start realizing that you need to hire people to be able to use that better equipment. But Can't then, just get the same people that but, you have. But then you've got yeah. a money problem because if someone's giving you a thousand quid for a video, mm -hmm. how do you make it happen? So you need freebies, favors. You have to hustle. Anybody that says they don't, their big brother is Spielberg. Mm -hmm. 
Do you see what I mean? Yeah. You have to hustle um, and you have to work hard. There's no shortcut, facts. So I'd come in um, and eventually when I was stopped getting the favors and certain people that, or equipment companies that owned the, the camera equipment would let me know what it was costing. I'm like, wow, it's like a thousand quid a day or whatever. And I'm like, if I've got three grand for a video or five grand for a video, a thousand quid is quite a lot of money. Yeah. Then you realize what it costs. So then it wasn't rocket science. I was like, okay, if I can eventually own this equipment, how much thousand pounds a day per shoot goes back in my pocket? How many years will it take to pay this off? It's just maths. Um, and, and literally that's how it started. I started, my, my mind started wondering. I was like, how can I make this work? Mm. Once I acquire this, it, everything is a dominoes effect in terms of your asset base. So I would work a full-time job. Uh, after I finished uni, I worked full-time as a, I, I'm, I'm a, like an expert in post-production. So my master's is in digital film and animation. So I was uh, editing and doing After Effects. After Effects is motion graphics software. Yeah. I, I did that for a production company in Covent Garden. People don't know this, but um, I'm very well versed in post. So I would work full time for very little money. I won't, I won't even say. No, I will say. I will say because people need to understand. Yeah, yeah. People need to see the whole yes. picture. Yeah. I, I was getting paid fifteen thousand pounds a year. Wow. And I was living in South East London, which is where I'm from, South East, mm -hmm. and I am working full time. People don't know this story. And I'm and I'm working. I'm costing me three hundred and fifty pounds a month for travel, just to get a tube, a train, a bus, and to walk some as well, just to get to work. Hour and forty five minutes a day. And after tax, I was had next to nothing. Yeah, left. kind of. Imagine. And I'm living by myself. There's no mummy, daddy supporting me, right? So I'm out there. I'm, I'm paying my own bills. So and this was this was after you come out of uni, after you done your masters. After I come out of uni. Okay. Um, after I come out of uni, so I got an entry job on no money. It was like trainee money but that was a, a junior position the only reason why i did that job was so all of the mastermind media money that was generated from music videos could be saved so i could save up and buy camera equipment mm -hmm. because okay. if, because most people that are filmmakers that is their bread and butter right the money comes in and then the money goes, it goes out you gotta yeah, pay your yeah. rent your petrol your phone bill your 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 bread your rice <laughs> yeah so this is interesting so effectively you're you had that as a side hustle almost by choice. Yeah, it was the only way. How, yeah. how else do you save? Yeah. Money needs to be disposable. Mm -hmm. If it's not disposable, how do you save? It's not rocket science. Most people are lazy and that's why they don't do it. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. I'm not special. I'm not a Marvel superhero. I'm just driven. And I understand if you work full time, you can pay your bills. Everything you make outside your full time job is savable money yeah. that can be capital investment. So it took me two years to be able to start buying parts of a camera. Then I was hiring accessories because I couldn't afford to buy the whole modular setup, but I started with the most expensive parts. And bit by bit, I bought and bought and bought and bought and bought till I had a camera package. When I had owned that camera right. package, yeah, yeah, not yeah. only am I now saving the money from the production line for equipment, mm -hmm. I'm renting out my asset to other filmmakers. So, so I'm, it's like, so it's, I'm, you're I'm, eating I'm, twice. I'm eating twice. You're eating twice, yeah. <laughs> Again, not rocket science. You, so this is, you say it's not rocket science, and it's not rocket science when you explain it, but not everybody's doing this. So there must, there must be an element of something within you, which is, it is obvious to you, but which maybe it's not obvious to something else. Yeah. Does, does that come from, like, I don't know, maybe your upbringing or something that you've, you've experienced that's kind of forced you to think that way? Or Well, well shout out to single parents. My mum, Caribbean woman, um, raised me single-handedly. And my savagery is a lot due to my mum. Not all, but she instilled the work ethic. Be somebody. You're a black kid. You have to work harder. Yeah, let's just call it how it is. So she instilled all of, the, all of the, the elephants in the room and addressed it by saying, don't complain, don't moan, work harder. That's how you solve it, win. Just win. What does it take to win? Discipline, focus, do it. Or shut up. <laughs> do you understand what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. Do it, work harder. Listen, we, we live in a society that isn't always fair, right? It isn't. But what are you gonna do about it? Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. So I was focused. 
from the offset. That's all it was. It was I, I was just focused. And I knew what I wanted, where I wanted to be. If I can see the top of the stairs, I have to take one step at a time. Rome wasn't built in a day. And young kids need to understand that. Say that again. If you, that sounded nice. Yeah, Say that Rome, again. Yeah. Rome wasn't built in a day. Yeah. You know, I can see the top of the stairs, but I have to take step by you step. You have to take step by step. Muhammad Ali said that, one yeah. of his famous quotes. Um, at the end of the day, you have to understand that as long as you can see it, then it can be done. And I saw the end goal. I saw where I wanted to be. And I thought, there's a solution here. And the solution is to do it. That's quite loaded. And you have to understand what that means. Mm -hmm. But if you people replay that, they'll understand. It's as simple as it sounds. Well, some people say, you know, like, do the obvious. Of course. It's like, maybe someone might think, oh, that's too straightforward. It's not that way. You've got to uh, do this or do that. But actually, it's do the obvious and do it consistently. Of course. You know, as long as we're not asking people to fly to a moon without a spaceship, then it can be done. <laughs> do you understand what I mean? And... Um, I think I just focused on the goals. I knew I wanted to be, and I just thought, okay, I know what to do to make it happen. Yeah. Obviously, be legitimate, everybody watching, do it the right way. Um, but that, I, just, I, I was just focused, I, I, and it really is that simple, honestly, it is. Um, but I understand the conflict of how do you save money, and this is what people don't understand, and it's a fair point. First of all, you need to be able to have an income. Some people are not fortunate enough to be able to have an income through whatever reason or circumstance. That is, that's also something that needs to be overcome. But if you can get yourself a full-time job somehow and get yourself a full-time income, then you can actually find a way to then make your side hustle your investment capital, your capital investment rather, you, you know? And that's all I did. I worked full-time. When I, when I did my master's, going back before I went to the work for the company in Covent Garden, um, I did a full-time master's and worked full-time. I wouldn't advise that um, at all because I think that's the only time in my life that I, I, I didn't sleep, like, because I physically couldn't. It wasn't about choice. Yeah. I had to work after school. I couldn't even attend half my lectures, yeah? Um, sorry, I had, I had to go to, I had to do my uni work after work, sorry. Um, and I couldn't attend a lot of my lectures, so I had to put, put dictaphones in class, mm -hmm. go to work. And then listen to it. Listen to it afterwards. Wow, yeah. That's how I had to do it. You, in those days, I mean, we're talking, 2008, 2009, so we're talking over 10 years ago, um, you have a dictaphone, you put it on a desk and you leave. Or if you've got a good friend that you can, that can just pattern you, yeah. say, record this for me, and you collect it after work. You listen to your three hour lecture, you go and do your assignment. You can't ask your teacher much, much your lecturer much questions. Because you're, you're not there. You're yeah, not, you're not there. Class, so you've got to send an email. She may or may not come back to you because she doesn't know that you didn't go to your lecture, but you need to pay your rent or your mortgage. You're, you know, most people, they rent. So that was what I was up against. It killed me, but, but it was the only way for me to get the skills, to be able to get the job that I wanted to get, to help pay my bills so I could allow my filmmaker money to be saved to buy equipment. So yeah, it's interesting that you've said that because uh, I feel like nowadays there's a, I don't know if stigma is the right word, but a lot of people are not really fascinated about going to university when they're taking a non-traditional entrepreneurial path, if you like. But clearly from you, it's played an important role in your story. And you was dedicated enough to be doing that at the same time as doing full-time work. Yeah. So what was it that made you think a master's was the right choice for you rather than just kind of trying to go straight into some form of work in this industry? Remember, I was st still doing a lot of things myself. Mm -hmm. So that was my avenue to be able to, to cut costs, to be able to not have to pay a motion graphics guy or an animator or an editor or a colorist. And I was doing it all. And that was, again, when you're working with low budget, sometimes you can't, you don't have the money to pay Peter, Tom and Paul. You have to be the one man army in it, a sense. Exactly. Yeah. So in order to not do a bodge job, I wanted to become really great at that particular section or sector. So I did the masters and I thought it was also a good way to take my academic achievements up an accolade a little bit further. Mm -hmm. and, and I was even considering doing a doctorate at one stage. Wow. Um, I didn't go down that route because filmmaking started to happen for me. And look where um, we are. Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, so it, start, it, it started to happen. And, yeah. um, and, and that, was, that was the purpose of it. But again, it was another way of if you've got a very tight budget, how do you retain the money within the budget? And you can also stretch it further. Sometimes I'm not charging out my, my post-production fee because I might need to hire a piece of equipment that's really important and integral to the production. So I will just take one for the team. But if I can't do it, I can't offset that cost. 
Right. Are you with me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all these skills were able to help me increase the production value, which does what? Eventually, clients will start giving you more and more money. The more money you have, the higher the production value. There was a stage how I got bigger productions budgets. I didn't take any markup for around two years. People don't know this. Like, I didn't take any markup. For two years, I thought, how do I get a five grand budget, a 10 grand budget, a 15, a 20? I need to make my videos look like it costs more money. Well, the way to do that is to put everything on screen. Mm -hmm. That means I take nothing. Even the petrol I need to drive to set, I don't take out production. Why? Because I had a full-time job. So that's right. how I was so doing this, it. So I had a Monday to Friday like job. Said before. Just right. like that, saving for, for the assets. Yep. In order, when I had to went for a section of trying to increase my production value and get bigger budgets, I put everything into the production to make a three grand look like a seven, make a seven look like a 12, a 15 look like a 30. And that was how it was done. So being able to have a main income stream to take away my pressure, I could apply everything out of those budgets to focus on my dream and grow my potential. Mm -hmm. And that was it. That's interesting. So it's like you're taking the hit in the short term, knowing that in the long term, short term gain, long term, back. short term pain, long term gain. Yeah, yeah. Basically. Pay it up front. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Again, requires discipline. Um, we can all do it. We can all do it. You have to just make a decision and stick to it. Yeah. Nice. Like anything, when you want to go gym, you don't get a six pack by going doing sit ups for one day. No, you don't. And 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 going on a low carb diet and low sugar diet for one day. Do it for six months and let's see the results. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. The same principle applies to anything you want to do in your life, whether it be you want to own a facilities house or manufacturing company or be a top executive producer or whatever. You have to be consistent. Once you are, you make progress. It's, it's, it's a byproduct. <laughs> it's a byproduct of the work. It's a byproduct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just what happens. You, 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 you eat lots of cake, you drink lots of coke, your teeth rots and you get fat. Byproduct. Mm. We'll do the opposite. It makes sense. And we've, we've, we've kind of talked about the productions, we talked about the rental equipment side of things. So then how did you get into kind of property? Because obviously you have the studio here, you, you had another one in East London, um, but you also have other properties as well, which you um, like, what's the word? Like rental properties that you're developing and stuff like that. It's not just these kind of physical studio properties. So how did you get into this side of things? And we also, we, we read an article recently about a new big deal. I'm not sure how much you're allowed to talk about, but if you could just touch on that, maybe even a little bit. Sure. Um, property is something that I always wanted to do because it makes sense. Uh, property is, it, it, when done properly, is safe and secure. There's a term, safe as houses, safe as houses has, a, yeah. has a couple of meanings. Um, definitely in terms of investment, if you know what you're doing, but it's low risk relatively, right? So... Um, because I was able, once I had lots of different uh, companies within the film industry, from Cameron Light and Rental, to film studio, to production company, to manufacturing my own lenses, which is my biggest company uh, by far. Uh, it's very niche, very specialist. That's why people don't know about it, because it's only the industry know. Um, but that was the biggest company that, that, that really moved. And with the money that came from there, I, just, I, I played Monopoly for five years. I literally, every time I made a certain amount of money, every time I did a six figure or whatever, bought a new property, bought a new property, bought a new property, bought a new property, renovated that one, et cetera, et cetera. And then you compound your asset. Um, capital growth kicks in, you, you, you invest X and it becomes Y just because you own property and you gain capital growth. Your passive income increases. Right. It's a no brainer. I, I know it's not easy. So I make it sound like, oh, you know, I had to build everything else in order to get there. So I'm not trying to make it sound like it's one, two, three, because most people don't yeah. own one house, right. let alone it's not as It's not as, I don't want to say straightforward, but as it's you say, not it's easy. not as, yeah, as no, straightforward listen, as the other It's not easy, easy and, 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 and I don't want to sound too, too flippant and blahs. I know property is hard. You know, most people don't own one home. So, so I'm not going to sell a dream, but the principle is the same. It, just like buying the camera, my first camera, was the same as buying the first house. Mm. Do you understand what I mean? You it's start the small the and same principle build and build applies. And build. How do you save money that doesn't require you to spend it on bills? Whether you buy a camera or you buy a flat or what have you, obviously it's all relative. Then you start buying multi million pound properties like I do, but I didn't start off doing that. I started off with one bedroom flats. So it takes time, mm. you know, it takes time and, and you just have to hang in there. And in terms of, yields like we don't have to go too much into exact numbers but 
does it make more sense to have somewhere like a studio or maybe to invest that same money into like a, a rental property or something? Don't, totally don't get a film studio unless you are in the industry and you know what you're doing and you have the money to make a proper film studio. Don't bother. You'll get not for proper film studio money. <laughs> yeah. But you'll pay the studio yeah, they'll, 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 yeah, there'll be, there'll, there'll be a serious accident. Mm. Uh, you know, th th there's a lot that can go wrong, but there's a lot that can go right there are only a handful of film studios in London for a reason. We're one of them. Um, so it, it, I, I would say there are easier things to do in the film industry. There's a reason why there's only a handful of film studios. Um, so you, I can't advise what you should do because it depends what that person wants to do and what they yeah. want to achieve. So I won't, I won't go there. But for you, what have you found has worked nicer? Um... See, so the film studio is synergy because I'm in the film industry. Right. Had so I not been in the film things. industry, it wouldn't yeah. have right, maybe right, made right. sense. Remember, I'm still shooting productions. I didn't shoot out my own, outside my own studio for about four years. Wow. So I didn't know what prices were being charged. I, didn't, I knew not much um, outside of before I owned a studio. And I've owned a film studio since 2014. We're now in 2021. Yeah. That's seven, seven years. years. So for seven years, I don't know what it's like to go and knock on the door and try and get availability. What I will say is this, there was one time that um, we had a massive client at one of my film studios uh, in E10, Vivo, um, do this massive, beautiful set called Discover. Oh yeah, I've seen that. Okay, yeah, so I've they were based that, yeah. at ours for a year, yeah, the East London version uh, uh, stage. And I remember um, I was shooting a big music video for Sean Paul and uh, Steph London. Mm -hmm. Um, under Master My Media, my production company, so I produced it, directed by Carly Cousin. And um, I couldn't find a film studio because Vivo were in my film studio. And I was like, a, I was like a, a fish out of water. I was like... What happens when you can't film in your own spot? I was like, <laughs> oh, it cost how much? Yeah. And we had to do set, set build, uh, uh, pre-light, strike. It's like the four day shoot. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't have the money for it. I started panicking and I had to, negotiate to get into my studio and pay a premium to pay the client just so I could use, use it for the day. Studio. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was unbelievable, <laughs> honestly. But, but it showed me how much of a commodity film studios yeah, are. Yeah. And I was so grateful that, again, it shows how well the synergy works. And that's why with Mastermind Media, we can provide so much value for money because we can offset a lot of those facility costs to make it work within a budget. It's why we work with so many independent directors because they like, we go to a guy that owns so much facilities, we can get more value. I thought the customer's point of view, like you just said, it makes perfect yeah, sense. It's, instead of having to call this person and this person, you just go at one place. It's, it's efficient. Story. It's efficient. Yeah. No, they're all individual companies, but I own them all, so it's easy for me to coordinate. Nice, nice. Um, and the next thing I want to talk about, kind of, is a, it's, it's a little bit more big picture. You've you've talked a lot about, and I've seen some videos on on your Instagram as well. You talked about the struggles of being, you know, effectively a black man. Mm -hmm. Uh, trying to succeed in a in a industry, maybe not an industry, but a society as a whole that you know has institutional racism, uh, systemic racism. The video I saw on your Instagram was uh, when you was with your Bentley and you was getting hassled by the police. Um, you talked to what, as well about what your mum told you. So how do you find it as a black man who's become so successful in this industry where there's not a lot of black men that have really reached the heights that you've reached? Yeah. How have you found it? And you know what advice do you have to young black guys that are trying to follow a similar path? It's very difficult um, because it's not simple to identify. You have to read between the lines and you have to work out the fact that a lot of people that are trying to get their foot through the door can't get their foot through the door or only can selectively. A lot of the people that are in the industry that want to get to that next level find themselves stuck. They don't get those big breaks, they don't get those great opportunities. It's hard to prove. <laughs> That's the problem, isn't but, it? But, yeah. but history is history. Mm -hmm. and, and the spade is a spade, right? So if you look at the amount of um, ethnic minority people that are trying to get into the industry, how many enthusiasts they are, and look at how many that are actually on set. <laughs> yeah. You know? Spade to spade, as you say, yeah. So it's not easy. It's not easy. And, and, and I have had to... I was not fortunate enough to have a mentor or a big brother or anybody in the industry that could say, hey, come in. 
come on set, I'll put you on the call sheet, come and stand by this director, uh, the director's uh, monitor. In fact, tell a lie once, uh, I did have um, a director friend once, but that was, I was quite fortunate. Um, but other than that, there wasn't anybody else. So how do you evolve? How do you learn what the professional conventions are and how you should conduct yourself with the correct etiquette? For example, on a proper film crew, you don't have your phone in your hand. At the high level, you get sacked and told to go home. On a low level production, people are texting, WhatsApp, everyone's snapping. What about the NDAs? The etiquette is terrible for low level production. Yeah. Nobody teaches these people how to have correct etiquette on set. So when that happens, it's very hard to get to the next level because, because you can't get onto that set to see how you're supposed to do things because nobody wants to let you in. <laughs> and it's just a cycle then, it's isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's a vicious cycle. It's a vicious cycle. So, um, yeah, I've had, to be, I've had to have a thick skin and I've had to be Iron Man and, and, and to kick my way through, not have it. So my, my advice... To, to answer your question, to um, ethnic minority males and females that feel that there could be uh, less opportunities and less of a platform is just keep trying. You know, I didn't have to bully anybody to get on. I was just persistent. Be a nuisance. Keep sending emails. Because you know, when, when somebody sees that you're really keen and passionate, it's hard to ignore you. It's hard. You know, I would suggest that. Show how important, learn stuff, research. When you do have that conversation with someone that you're trying to get in, talk jargon. Let them see that you're not a waste of space because you can't rely on everybody else to bring you. Sometimes bring yourself to a certain extent and then wait for the opportunity. They say luck is a combination of when, is it when timing meets, meets, when preparation meets opportunity, you know? So prepare waiting for the opportunity. But if you don't prepare, you can't expect an opportunity. Do you see what I mean? Again, applies to any industry. But to get good luck, you need to do that. Yeah. Something you've said is about how, you know, a lot, of, a lot of us trying to come up, we don't have the kind of mentors that we need to get to the next level or, you know, at least... I feel like maybe there's, there's some other people, they do have that mentorship at the start, but, you know, a lot of us don't. And that's something that I've heard you talk about. You've talked about a foundation and wanting to eventually get to the point where you're able to mentor others. So how do you kind of see that going in the future for yourself? Do you know what is the, 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 There are two facets to what I want to do to, to help encourage people to, to, insp to inspire, basically. There are two facets. Firstly, um, uh, recently I've received an, an unprecedented amount of DMs from young people some not so young, um, we know white, black, Chinese, everybody, all walks of life, asking for guidance, for mentorship, and what I can do to help, and can they be around, and, and, and I'm absolutely touched and humbled. Like, I'm ridiculously humbled, yeah? Um, so it, it's, it's put me in a position where I can't spend time with every single person. There's not enough of me to go out. <laughs> but I'm gonna be starting a, a, a mentoring academy very soon that's gonna be able to help consolidate a lot of my um, uh, um, help and advice um, to, to people simultaneously. Uh, there'll be more information about that. We'll contact you guys once that's yeah, set up. It's, it's, yeah. it's actually currently being constructed at the moment, the, the infrastructure. Um, and also there's the foundation, which I mentioned before in the, in the Forbes article. I, I would like to use the facilities that I have to help people come along and get their experience, to be taught that etiquette, how to conduct yourself on a film set, how to use certain equipment, what job roles there are, how long it takes, some examples, let them be around and immersed in the, in the space and the atmosphere. And I think that that's a really good way of giving people an insight yeah. onto the next level and make them feel encouraged about, okay, I can do this or I don't wanna do this, but whatever it is, it gives them a platform. And obviously that will be free of charge. Um, so I'll be working with some, some organizations via the foundation that I'll create in order to do that. And I have the facilities, so it's a great way to be able to to, to give people the, the uh, access and the exposure to it, basically. Yeah. That's really powerful because, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of people, when they're, they're coming up, the people that they see around them that are making money or doing well or successful is not necessarily in these kind of industries. So they don't necessarily put two and two together. They don't think, oh, I can actually make money doing this or doing yeah. that because there's no exposure to it, like you said. So, yeah, I think it's an amazing figure. I think it's really going to help bridge that gap between 
people choosing, shall we say, other routes yes. to make money when these are actually like good ways. And we don't say it on a on a flashy thing or a, but it's like the way to, you know, earn income. Provide yeah. for your family, provide for your Listen, we, we we need to change the narrative, we need to change the mindset. Um there are a lot of positive people um doing great things like me. There's loads of them. Um but there's a lot of people that are doing things the wrong way and that isn't best for them and, and, and the people around them that love them. And I guess what we're trying to say is you can be super successful. You can do flashy if you want to do flashy, but do it the right way. You know, work hard. Don't be lazy. Man up or woman up. It can be done. And, and yes, there are loads of obstacles in the industry, in the country, in, in, our, in our own personal circumstances that prevent us from being the best version of ourselves. But if you focus on trying to be that person, you can make it happen. Like I said, it was done before them and it will be done after them. So what's their excuse and what's their reason? And as long as they try to surround, them, surround themselves with like-minded people, watch really important pages and um, uh, uh, video blogs like this, or you guys, then, then they're that one step closer because they're now taking the right information and, and they, can, they can absorb and, and process it. So I, I kind of want people to understand that, yes, you can do it. You can, why not? And that's the question they should ask themselves. So hopefully if you can change that frame, uh, that mind frame and get people to understand, to, to aim bigger, to put that work in, to be legit, be nice, be a nice person. You know, don't be aggressive, smile, be nice, be helpful. People, that, that energy will resonate for starters. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So it's about understanding how to conduct yourself. And, you know, generally good happens to good, bad happens to bad, generally, you know, as a general rule. So focus on that and being positive and giving positive energy. And most of the time it will come back and, and, and reward you. Perfect. Yeah, man. Honestly, it's been a real, real pleasure to meet yeah, you yeah, today. Yeah. Thank you. I feel like we've learned a lot. I feel like the followers are going to get real, real value out of this. So honestly, thank you for having us. And hopefully it's not the last time yeah, yeah, we get to speak sure. again soon. But Absolute thank you very pleasure. much, man. No, thank you. Thank you.